I'm author Sarah Faxon coming to you from S. Faxon Productions, and today we're going to be interviewing another author in our author interview series. We'll be interviewing my friend Jerry Stravey about his books, First Spouse of the United States, and his upcoming works, Braxton Century. So Jerry, I want to thank you very much for coming today. Great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So Jerry and I met in the Writer's Crutch, which is an author's uh, marketing uh, class, which was brought to us by Tamara, uh, Tamara Merrill and Jerry Stravey. And it was so much fun. It was such a great class. And we're definitely going to talk about that at the end. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, I want to talk to Jerry about his books. Now, I'm currently about two thirds of the way through First Spouse of the United States. So I'm absolutely loving it. It is such an adventure. And there have been so many times where I've actually had to put the book down and be like, oh my gosh, this poor guy, because I'm just so in love with Rocky. Jerry, you've done an amazing job with this character. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit more about him to introduce him to our watchers here? Okay. All right. Uh, Rocky, uh, Ricardo Chambers uh, is a guy that I have uh, set up where he's in high school in La Jolla and goes to La Jolla High School. He's a football player. He's a man about campus and what have you. So we kind of, um, it, the first chapter is a flashback to his high school years and then it proceeds all the way on through. And uh, he's just the kind of guy that everybody wants to be like, you know, uh, or every girl wants to date, but it's not everything that you see is not what you see. And so that's kind of how I start the book. It's like, okay, this is Mr. Marvelous, but things are going to change. And change they do. And it's so interesting to go through his journey um, right there with him from his perspective. And one of the things that you really touch very well on is being with that character in the moment. Now it's not written first person perspective necessarily, but you are there with Rocky. And one of the things that I really appreciated so far is that you describe things the way Rocky sees them or your characters who surround Rocky see them. So one of the examples is you talk about AIDS and, you know, huge topic in the 80s, but nobody really knew what was going on. And you've captured that where they're like, yeah, there's this thing happening not really sure what's going on, but you want to be a little bit more careful here. And, you know, coming at this from the perspective of 2020, where we we know what it was, we know how it affected, how it had huge, drastic, horrible, um, devastating effects um, globally. And, you know, with illness on everybody's mind right now during our, um, our crisis of today, um, it's interesting how you've been able to Tra not trap us in that time, but bring us back to that time, which feels very real right now where we're not sure what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how, how was that balance for you as a writer being like, you know, this is what we knew at this time. And I want to ensure that we remember that at a point we didn't know what was going on. So how do you kind of pick and choose? Like what, what, what facts do you want to bring out? What do you want us to know? How did you um, figure out that balance? Well, it really wasn't very difficult because as an author, I try to put myself in the shoes of whoever I'm writing about at the moment. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I was able to have Rocky's perspective, because, you know, I, I, I couldn't go into what other people were thinking, but I could go into what Rocky was thinking. But I could also mm -hmm. project Rocky being around other people who are experiencing that moment with him. And this particular case with the thing where you're referring to about uh, AIDS, his grandfather is the one who is discussing it, which is interesting because he's mm -hmm. the he's the um, high school graduate who is visiting his father in Boston, uh, his grandfather in Boston, and it just turns out that Rocky's uncle has the gay flu. Mm -hmm. That is from his grandfather's perspective, and I have Rocky thinking about that. And, and, and experiencing it from the first time, which is kind of a unique situation. Because yeah. back in the 80s when this was going on, people experienced it themselves from being directly involved in it. They certainly weren't hearing it from someone two generations removed from them. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of took that approach to um, just take it from a different angle, make it more interesting. And it was. And, you know, it 
it felt so relatable to today where we don't know what's going on. We right. don't know necessarily. Well, I mean, we know a little bit more now and because of where technology is and um, our science that we have available to us at this point, you know, we're able to learn things much more, more quickly, but it, you know, it really grounded me reading those right. scenes of just this reminder of like, this has been within the last 30 years where, right. you know, something like this was going on and nobody knew what was happening. And so, right. you know, I, I really connected to that. And but you know, what experience in the book is what we all experienced back then. Mm. That was reality for us. I mean, when I look today where we're going through the pandemic, this is so much more understandable and so much easier for me to internalize than the AIDS thing was. Because back then it was, first of all, it was the... Um, God's curse on homosexuals. Mm. So we, those of us who were looking around and wondering what were going on, were being persecuted at the same time. Yeah. So uh, this pandemic, as terrible as it is at this time, it's different. It's different this time around. Yeah, and that's that's a really big thing to bring up, is that, you know, how... I, how people, I think, of my generation sort of forget that, you know, this is our first major um, illness that we recall. I mean, we were probably kids towards the end of, you know, the the true fear factors of that were being projected out there with the AIDS crisis. We don't really remember that. And so that's why I think it's so important to have books like yours that really just put that back in our face and be like, oh, you know, we've we've lived in a time where it's much more open and much more understanding. And there's so much more information and, you know, love going on where we understand. Um, and you're not evil because you have COVID-19. Exactly. Yes. And so, you know, seeing that is just a really good reminder of grounding us in what how far we've come, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think that's it's a beautiful reminder within your book. Um, because, you know, COVID-19 is also... Um, the second pandemic of my generation. It's, it's, it's the, first. the first one. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. And, you know, to think of how quickly this one spreads as well, too. I mean, you know, it, it's incredible. It really is incredible. And so, um, you know, it's it's interesting to see these two similar-ish situations, but how, oh, very, yeah. you, you know, how far we've come in being able to understand and prepare and get information out and not be casting shame or doubt in other um, perspectives from our own. Um, yeah, so, it's interesting, you know, when they're talking about getting a uh, vaccine out for COVID-19 in a year to 18 months, they still haven't found one for AIDS. It's interesting. <laughs> it makes you wonder. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but AIDS wasn't a big part of the book. It was just part of it. I was part yeah. of the experience. And um, in the book, when we're going through, there are so many other extenuating circumstances and situations. And when I wrote the book, I did not make it a topic so much about uh, a gay guy and what have you. It was a, about pursuing your dreams, living as authentically as you possibly could, and being true to yourself, having integrity, um, and just dealing with what, what you were dealt with the best way you could. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of timeless, really, when you look at it. And um, the characters in the book, uh, you've got Rocky, you've got Sheila, and you've got Nick. These are pretty incredible people. And they have their character, uh, their characters are developed along the lines of uh, people confronting confronting three very different situations um, side by side. Mm -hmm. You know, that one of the things that um, I found so fascinating too, or I have found so fascinating is the emotional roller coaster that I've gone on with uh, Rocky um, mm -hmm. from his yeah. incredible highs to those moments where I'm just like, Oh, hang on. You're going to be okay. It's going to get right. better. Um, that's been really, really captivating. And something that happens to me, and I, I'm curious if it happens with you as well, is your characters become a part of you. You know, even yes. after you put the pen down, you know, they're still there with you. Have you mm -hmm. found that as well on your journey? Oh, sure. Um, well, you as an author can probably relate to this. And even people who have just tell stories in their head, that's how I got started on this. And we can talk about that later. But 
When I'm writing this book, they are living with me 24 hours a day. <laughs> and I will go to bed at night and I'm thinking, okay, now how do I get through this situation? How do I tell this part of it? Or how do I do this, that? And then something creeps in. It's like, uh, let's say, for instance, I'm going over something that Rocky's going through, then all of a sudden Nick comes into my head or the grandfather comes in or maybe um, – some other character they enter into it and then they reaction i just start it's like taking up working on clay if you if, if you've ever had a, a clay wheel and you're they're forming something and then you realize uh maybe your finger touches it and it creates a different line and you decide to go somewhere else with it mm. or as you're forming the piece something happens and it takes a totally different shape and that is what happened with me because when i write my books I don't outline, outline them ahead of time. I have a general idea where I'm going, but, oh, God, it, they just take a life of their own. So I huh. appreciate you bringing that up because my characters drive my book. That's really interesting. You know, we On the uh, podcast that I'm a part of, the Semi-Sages of the Pages, that's something we bring up a lot. Are you a plotter or are you a pantser? And, you know, I, I tend to be in the combination where I'll, I'll plot it down as much as I can and, you know, get into really detailed um, scenes. But then when I'm there with the characters, it's just like you said, they're like, no, we're actually going to go this way. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting to hear that, you know, how they well, guide the story. First spouse of the United like States, I had a plan in the back of my head, a general outline of a story in my head where I wanted to go. Well, like we're talking, it didn't happen that way. And uh, <laughs> now I have to have a sequel. So I'm writing the sequel now. Oh, I'm so excited to hear that. <laughs> Yay, I'm glad. That's really You're going to either hate or love the ending. Do not give it away. I, will not I had spoilers. one person <laughs> who hated the ending so much he tore out the last page. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this isn't real. <laughs> so I knew I'd done it right. So. When you can connect to um, your readers to that extent, where yeah. they are so emotionally connected to these characters, we're like, no, this is not how it's going to end. I think you've done your job right. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something interesting. What First, I was kind of disappointed in this, but I have three daughters and one of them has special needs and... Um, that actually enters into the book a little bit. But but my other two daughters are both very um, tuned to literature, acting, theater, and all that good stuff. But neither of them could finish the book ah. because it is so personal. Ah. And they almost felt like this is too uncomfortable for to read something my father has written of this nature. Mm. So, Interesting. I w and um, so that really didn't sink really well with me in the beginning. And then I really said, oh, well, you lose. <laughs> so. <laughs> you know, a long time ago, someone gave me advice to that effect of something like, you know, your best friends in the world, the ones who will live and die for you. If they don't read your book, do not take offense. And that has been so yeah. <laughs> such yeah. good advice because, you know, they'll be there for you in other ways. And um, that's been a big part of my learning journey is being like, you know, it's okay if people in my immediate circle, you know, aren't flipping the pages and um, I can go to them for help and love and other well, it just, What it does is it just means you can make it, make sure it turns into a movie. Then they have to go. They have to go. <laughs> I mean, exactly. you might have to give them popcorn or something, but they have to go. Such sacrifices, right? <laughs> well, you so, know, we're here to serve humanity in our role as authors. It's our duty. <laughs> So speaking of our role as authors, um, one of the things that I really, really um, gleaned from you and Tamara Merrill um, was how it's incumbent upon us, the authors, to take our marketing reins into our own hands. Now, yes. that has been such a strong chord for me. Um, I've been doing a ton of research into doing traditional publication for my upcoming book, Blue Dragon Society, and not across the board, but a recurring theme is that it still comes back to me, the author for marketing. Would you like to talk a bit more about how, um, if this was a part of something you and Tamara figured out and how you were able to design writer's crutch around the lessons you've learned about what traditional and self-publishing um, routes take for your marketing journeys? Okay. 
I'm probably going to go around Robin Hood's barn on this as I explain what's going on. But I wrote another book before I wrote First Spouse of the United States. This book is called Braxton Century, and it has not been published. It's currently in a content editing stage for the second or third time. Mm. Um, when I originally wrote Braxton Century, I had no idea how to write a book. I'd gone through a illness. And... Um, Long story short, I just started writing. I started writing it in um, August 9th of 2017 and finished writing it in December 5th of that same year. And I was about 100,000 words, 140,000 words. Wow. I just wrote. And I'd never <laughs> written a book before. So I had this um, manuscript um, draft ready to go and kind of figure out, okay, what do I do next? So... Long the question so many of us ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do I do? I mean, it's like the blind leading the blind in a in a in a cave that has no outlet. And um, so, I ran across a situation where I ran into this um, hybrid uh, publisher who did their very best to help, but it just wasn't the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. And I realized more and more what I didn't know. And all of a sudden, I just felt like this mountain. This, uh, you know, um, huge mountain of ignorance. That's what I really felt like. I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no way, idea how to get up this mountain. How do I get up this and market my book? It was, just, it was like one avalanche after another coming off down, just tossing you to the side and throwing you about. So um Kept picking myself up, going back at it, and talked to a lot of people. And um, little bit by little bit, I was able to make it a little bit further up the mountain. And then another rock slide would come along, push me back, and then i get back up. And so this thing has been going on. I'm not at the top anywhere near at the top yet, but I'm still making my way up there. And fortunately, I have friends like you that we do this together, and it makes the journey uh, so much more multifaceted and enjoyable you know, along the way, I'm enjoying the journey now where before I was, was not happy camper. Okay. Yeah. So I understand that. <laughs> yeah. So, so many I, authors I, do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get a point in life one time at some point you think, Oh God, I learned this. I want to share this. So maybe I can help someone. So that was in the back of my head all along. And I spent a lot of time, I was a parent and I, you know, been a business owner and I've had different leadership things and what have you. So you, you get in the habit of sharing, right? So I was um, I joined the San Diego Writers and Editors Guild a couple years ago, and there was a meeting about eight months ago that we were talking about marketing. Now, and I had been through a lot of marketing classes, and I felt that I was picking up a lot of information, but I didn't I couldn't get all that information to come together, gel together, where I could just make make it work for me and, and get out there and get things done with all this really neat uh information that i had learned and very valuable information so i was sitting in the class and there was this gal uh her name is tamara merrill and uh she was talking about how she had put together an 18-month calendar for marketing her books and she's written i think at least five books and umpteen sh short stories i think she's in seven anthologies but she's been writing all her life she's a very talented writer and uh so I felt a little carnivorous at the moment because I said, I got to latch onto that. She's doing exactly <laughs> what I want to do because I've always been a planner. I've always plotted out my schedules, my goals and where I wanted to be. But I didn't know enough on how to put this thing together in a cohesive manner. And darn it, I was just frustrated after a lot of money, more time than you can imagine and getting nowhere fast. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I reached out to her. And immediately we decided, hey, we can do this together. We can make our own calendars better. You've heard the old adage, if you want to learn something, you teach it. Mm -hmm. so, so we decided true. that we would do that. And we put together this class, um, eight classes, three hours each. And you, you and so many other marvelous people participated in it. And it's one of those serendipities where Tamar and I came away from this class realizing we had learned more than we had taught. And uh, it was just a win-win for everybody. Yeah. And we took great pleasure, not only in sharing what we knew, but watching people put things to use, things that we had learned, 
not just from ourselves and our own experiences, but we were learning from the classes we were going through. And it became a very, um, I don't know, I think it became a very synergetic and um, uh, a working group, you know, that where we kind of all work together and just help each other move forward. So it's a lot of work, that class. There's a lot of, I think we had, oh God, hundreds of hours we put into planning it. I the darn syllabus, <laughs> the darn syllabus, I think is 50 or 60 pages long. <laughs> so we covered a lot of material, but it was a great, great, it was great doing it. And today I'm better at marketing my books, um, implementing what we taught and what we learned from our students. And, you know, it really was phenomenal. I mean, you, you said it so well. I mean, and not having a clear direction, like, yeah, I want to sell books. I want to get my name out there. That's the direction, but you got to set your sales and know which way to go to get right. there. And um, what I really, really enjoyed from the classes, I, I'm also a planner. I have to have my day-to-day -day schedule um, outlined, was that it wasn't just a today I'm going to do this, this week I'm going to do this. It's 18 months you're going to do this. Right. And so working, one of the most helpful things I found was, knowing that timeline okay blue dragon society i'd like to have published at this time which means three months before that i have to have this done you know five months before six months and then working backwards that's been huge so that right. was probably one of the the first aha moments for me we right. talk about aha moments a lot in my semi-sage group um that was huge and having that organization was so wonderful but one of the things that i enjoyed the most like you said was was communicating with each other and learning from each other and we're still doing it and now we're having these wonderful happy hours where we all get together and are holding each other accountable um you know the community that you and tamara fostered was absolutely wonderful and we're all so grateful for everything that you two did and are continuing to do for us and um i know to you viewers out there i highly highly recommend the class um or finding something like it or right putting in the effort to learn about marketing it is right. so important you know you can't just post once or twice a week on instagram you mm -hmm. have to really figure out as you know if taking a class like this will tell you finding your audience if you just start there that's probably one of the best points um you can stem from and um, you know one of the things that you do really well is with your blogs what have you and i've had a, i had i did a blog recently um on um, Captain Crozier, the fellow that was a uh, commanding officer of the USS uh, Theodore Roosevelt, mm -hmm. when he and a lot of his 800 of his crew came down with the uh, coronavirus. And I did a blog on that, and it was really fascinating to get responses and feedback coming back because the blog wasn't about so much COVID is it was about the actions that you take when you're under stress or when you're in a difficult situations and the unforeseen consequences of those actions mm. and how you know life is stranger than fiction so true <laughs> and in this case in the blog i talked about sure they were ill, they were sick. And when you have 800 people out of four or 5,000 people on board ship, that's a lot who are sick. But you gotta remember, why is that ship there? That ship mm. is there to protect us and our nation. And if the enemy is aware that you've lost up to 20% of your crew, they might attack you. Yeah. So. It's a very interesting point. Know your, know your enemy, but most of all, to know your enemy, you have to know yourself. Mm -hmm. So. A neat thing about being an author is you can bring life experience, you bring experience in life to a different level and share uh, share so much without feeling like you're pontificating and maybe you are, but people <laughs> are enjoying while you scream at them and call them an idiot, you know. But um, <laughs> but it, it's kind of fascinating and, and a serendipity in my marketing because. I was I was talking about that situation with COVID-19 and relating it back to Rocky's experience in First Spouse of the United States is his role is a 
naval fighter pilot on board an aircraft carrier during the Iraq Iran War. Mm. So it's weird how this all comes around and together and brings a lot of synergy to what you're talking about. So I'll have people reading First Spouse of the United States who would never have had the opportunity to read it. But at the end of my blog, I've got that mention of the fact that I'm an author, blah, blah, blah. And that, cool, like huh? you said, yeah, bringing it all back together and making those connections and um, finding other ways to be creative, right? Right, <laughs> right. Um, and so, you know, Jerry, I want to thank you so much for joining us here tonight. This has been absolutely wonderful. Again, guys, go check out Jerry Strivey's uh, books, First Spouse of the United States. Be sure to keep out, keep an eye out for Braxton Sentry. It's going to be fantastic. Right. Cannot wait to read that. And we'll be sure to have links to Jerry's website in the description below. Right. Again, Jerry, thank you so much. Absolutely pleasure to have you here. Well, great being here. And I really, uh, really um, have enjoyed getting to know you and everyone else in the class and so grateful that we're, we're able to continue our friendships and help each other along. Thank you. Be sure to click the subscribe button for more author interviews, writing tips, and insights into a writer's life.